So now we turn our attention to suicide prevention. And you may be wondering, we've already talked about suicide treatment, so isn't that suicide prevention? And the answer is yes, as you'll see, that's part of it. But suicide prevention is a broader umbrella, and it involves more than just um, psychological treatment. So we're going to talk about the multitude of ways that uh, suicide can be prevented, uh, including ways that you can help. So one thing that I think is worth mentioning is what works? Well, it's hard to say. Suicide is such a low base rate behavior that it's hard to really determine for a lot of these interventions whether or not they're reducing suicide or not. It, you know, it's hard to know for those, you know, if you are doing a social media campaign, for instance, it's hard to know if those who ended up um, dying by suicide saw your social media campaign before they died. So it's a really tricky area to evaluate. So with that, the focus um, has been on bending the curve. And with this, it's when we talk about the curve, it's um, really the suicide rate. It's it's seen a change in the suicide rate. So um, I mentioned in a previous video, I was recently at the SAMHSA Suicide Prevention Conference, and they were talking about some data um, that was really exciting for state Garrett Lee Smith grants. And what they were saying is that for the counties that um, had implemented um, suicide prevention for youth, the youth in those counties actually had significantly lower suicidal um, suicides. They had fewer suicides for youth than in counties around those that had not received the intervention. So there is some evidence that what we do is working, but it feels odd compared to a lot of other areas in psychology. We always want to make sure that what we're doing is empirically supported because we don't want to spend time on an intervention that doesn't work. And we need to keep working on evaluating these um, these different interventions that we do to provide empirical support. But it's always going to be a challenge. So the first outreach we'll talk about are public awareness ads. So you can see just a couple examples of these. Um, we're actually, as part of our suicide grant, going to start doing um, social media outreach um, starting in the fall. So that's an example of a public awareness um, ad or outreach. So the problem is that these types of campaigns are rarely evaluated. So we don't know much about whether or not they work. The, uh, our campus is very lucky. SAMHSA is doing a special evaluation for us where they're actually coming to campus and um, going to be stopping students, asking if they've seen our campaign um, to figure out how big the reach is. You know, are we reaching those who may be at risk of suicide? So there are things you can do to evaluate it, but they're often not evaluated. Uh, those that have... Um, evaluated shows that they have modest effects and those effects are primarily about um, the causes of mental illness and treatment. So people that see the ads are more likely to um, view mental illness as a you know, disorder and um, not a weakness and will be more likely to seek treatment. However, as Mann and colleagues mentioned in the um, reading that you have to read, they found no detectable effect on primary outcomes of decreasing suicidal acts or on intermediate measures such as uh, more treatment seeking or increased antidepressant use. So it's not clear how much of an effect the ads actually have. Um, it's one of those things that seems like a good idea. I don't think they're harming anything. It's just not clear how much they're actually increasing um, uh, you know, increasing help seeking or things like that. Physician screening. We've talked about this a little bit, I believe, but depression is extremely underdiagnosed and undertreated, and um, especially in primary care settings. So there have been many studies that have found that, uh, especially for older adults, but overall too, um, most people who die by suicide. Um, saw their primary care physician within a month of the suicide. Now, some of those individuals surely will have not, you know, 
probably thought about suicide after that visit, but I'm sure there are plenty of them where they had suicidal ideation at the visit. So there have been many studies that have looked at whether we could educate primary care physicians um, about mental illness and whether this would increase detention and treatment. And overall, the effects um, have been mixed. Most of those studies have looked at um, educating primary care physicians about depression, and some find that more people get to, are treated for depression, others have found doesn't make a difference. What does seem to make a difference is um, the studies that have gone a step further and actually had um, active care management, where there's someone that you know follows the client, made sure that they're going to the appointments, um, you know, at someone that's actually tasked with asking about these sorts of things. Um, interventions like that, as you see in the Man article, actually do reduce suicide contempt, uh, suicide attempts. Sorry about that. Compared to treatment as usual. So we know that if we have that active care management, um, that makes a difference, and it makes sense. You know, as I won't go into it too much in the lecture, but the man article talked about how our treatment adherence is really horrible for mental health, and it's actually that's true for everything. Um, you're guilty of this. I'm guilty of this. How many of us have had a uh, prescription for an antibiotic and not done the whole thing, you know, not taken all of it. Almost all of us have done that. So if you do that when you're not suffering from a mental illness, you can imagine how easy it is to not do it when you're taking an SSRI or something. You know, you're taking an antidepressant, maybe you're having some side effects, so you just decide to stop it. Um, so with that, having that continued care management where someone follows you and checks up on you and makes sure that you're doing all right is really important and does really improve the quality of the care that we receive. Gatekeeper training. So what is this? This is actually something we have on campus. If any of you are interested and are on campus at Starkville, um, I'd be happy to get you linked in with one of our trainings. We do it free of charge through our grant. but what gatekeeper training is, is it's training individuals who are likely to be in contact, in contact with those who are at risk. And it helps you identify the signs of someone who's distressed and help you know how to make a referral for that person. So with this, you want to think about who are the individuals who are going to see, in our case, students who are potentially suicidal where the counseling center or people in psychology may never see them. You know, one of the, some of the best people to have trained as gatekeepers are um, the facilities individuals who clean the, um, the dorms, RAs, uh, the people that work in the dining hall. You know, these are people that may see you when you're struggling, but your professor may never know. You know, your professor may know that you haven't come to class, but they don't know that, you know, you've been sitting in a corner for two weeks in your dorm. But your RA or your, you know, the the people that work in your dorm may know that. So with that, what we want to do is find as many people, they don't have to be mental health you know, professionals, but just p people who are going to be in contact with those who are potentially at risk and train them to know how to identify someone who's at risk, to be able to approach that individual, talk to them, and refer them for treatment. That's all gatekeeper training is, is it's um, identifying and making that referral into treatment. And we do know that this makes a difference. There have been studies in the military, both um, in the U.S. and elsewhere, that have found that gatekeeper training successfully reduces suicide rates. So we know it works, and it's a vital piece of um, suicide prevention. So again, if you're on Starkville campus, let me know. I'd be happy to hook you in with one of those um, trainings. I'd, I'd truly be, I'd love to do it. So let me know. Mental health screening. So you may have seen where we do this. We do this um, 
couple times a year usually. It's usually Tim Tavalski who's in this class in health and wellness or the counseling center that will do this. But it's where they set up, you know, like the depression screening. You can fill out a questionnaire and they'll let you know if you may need services or not. So with this, the first piece that people always worry about is if I ask someone about suicide, is that going to give them my, give them the idea? Is that going to increase suicide risk? And the answer is no. Um, Madeline Gold, of, um, she had a great study uh, looking at youth where she showed very convincingly that asking about suicide does not increase suicide risk. You're not going to give someone the idea. Um, if anything, it may actually reduce suicide risk. Plus, you're going to identify those who are having suicidal ideation and really need to be in treatment. So don't be afraid to ask someone if they're thinking of suicide. You're not, you're not going to increase risk just by asking. So what do we see as far as the effects of these mental health screenings? Well, what we see is between, depending on the study, a 10 and 47% increase in the rate of detection and diagnosis of depression. So it does help us with identifying depression. Now, we really have no idea if it helps us prevent suicide. The research just isn't clear. There just isn't much on it. Uh, but that's a place that there's a great need for research. But it made sense that if, you know, if you're depressed, suicidal thoughts are quite common with depression. So doing the mental health screenings likely has some positive effect. So we've already talked a little bit about treatments, but I wanted to um, talk a little more broadly because the treatments that we talked about were well, it's primarily just TMs, let's be honest. But there are other treatments that work for reducing suicide. So two medications have been shown to be to reduce suicide risk, uh, lithium for bipolar disorder and clozapine for schizophrenia. So antidepressants, this is a messy topic. Um, so meta-analyses are studies of studies. So it's a, looking at multiple studies, bringing all those people together. And... Um, Meta-analyses have not found significant benefits of antidepressants in reducing suicides or suicide attempts. So that's concerning. Um, now, there is some correlational data that supports antidepressant use for suicide. What we see is that higher prescription rates of antidepressants are associated with lower suicide rates by country. So if a country has more antidepressant use, by and large, they have lower suicide rates. However, it's not clear whether or not that's caused by the antidepressant. There's also, of course, the um, black box warning with antidepressants that they may cause or increase suicidal thoughts among youth. Now, with that, um, knowing that this video goes out on the internet, um, I'm always cautious what I say with this. What I, the main point I want to drive home is whatever your doctor's advices, that's what I would follow. So even with that black box warning, um, really that's more a warning to the doctor than anything in my mind. It's saying that this may develop and you need to be checked um, up on regularly, especially at first, um, to make sure that um, the suicidal ideation is again worse or developing. But with that, if you have depression, it needs treated. And um, Antidepressants are a very viable treatment for for depression. So if you're suicidal and your doctor has prescribed antidepressants, I really think you should take them. Um, that said, it's the data just aren't that strong that actually taking them will reduce suicides or suicide attempts. Um, in my mind, just my two cents, I don't think it's going to hurt in most cases. But... Um, but also, it's not a wonder drug. Um, and because of that, personally for me, if I, if I was suicidal, um, being on an antidepressant is very good, but I would not just do that. I'd also do psychotherapy. 
So with cytotherapy, there are many effective treatments um, that have been shown to reduce suicide risk. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, problem solving therapy, interpersonal therapy, dialectical behavior therapy is great for um, borderline personality disorder. And then CAMS, which we talked about, are just a few of them. And to give you an idea of the effect of this, cognitive therapy, for instance, in a study, half the suicide reattempt rate compared to those who received usual care. So these therapies are effective. And um, so in my mind, best practice is combining, um, if you do use pharmaceutical therapy, uh, combine it with psychotherapy. And if you're suicidal, you're depressed enough, that probably makes sense to do both. So if if I was talking to a psychologist, um, worked with someone who is suicidal, I'd say I'd recommend a psychiatry consult for that individual as well. Um, because even though it's antidepressants, the literature's met, um, I still think it made sense for what it's worth. But I also just have to be honest with what the literature says. So um, you can make up your own mind as a clinician, um, just so long as it's based in the literature. So now for some good news. So I don't know how you're feeling, but when I got to this point with making the slides, I felt like, you know, a lot of this is bad news. A lot of this is, well, we don't know if this works or, um, you know, I don't know how I, as a just a person, can make a difference. But it reminds me of that um, the story that's presented in the Joyner Myths About Suicide book about the individual who um, died by suicide, where he wrote in the suicide note that if even one person smiled or said something to him on the way, that he wouldn't do it. Um, sometimes it's not a big intervention that's needed. Sometimes little things can make a difference. So, a couple thoughts. Um, this is one of the this is one of the studies that really just when I got into this field amazed me and really excited me. So I'm hoping that it'll do that for you. So caring letters. So this was a study led by Jerome Motto, who is a psychiatrist, and um, he said brief caring postal letters, or just sent letters following discharge from um, from an inpatient facility, and did this initially monthly, and then tapered it off to quarterly, and did this for five years. So all the only thing that was done is they mailed letters. That's all they did. That's the only intervention. And compared to those who had no further contact, the people that received caring letters had significantly lower suicide rates for the first two years of the trial. Just by getting letters saying, you know, we're thinking about you, and if you need anything, call us. That's all it took to reduce suicide rates. Very simple intervention. And there have been other studies that have um, shown that uh, supportive phone calls, texting, postcards, these have been shown to reduce suicidal behavior. So it doesn't always have to be a big intervention. You know, if you're suicidal, you, sh you should go in for therapy. You should get medication. But with that, there are things that ordinary average people can do too. Um, and there's actually an ongoing, so currently going on, a trial um, with the military with using caring letters, with using this intervention to reduce suicide. So that's cool. That's been shown to work. That's cool. I don't know. I think it's cool. So with that, I want to kind of end on this. So what's required to save a life? You don't need a PhD or an MD. You don't need a degree. You don't need formal training. And you don't have to have experienced depression or suicidal ideation. What you have to do is care. Um, you have to care and also have the bravery to talk to someone to see if they're all right, knowing that, you know, it may not be convenient if the answer is no, but, but you can make a difference. You know, part of why I'm teaching this class is I want to increase the number of people that realize that they can make a difference in this field and they can 
save a life. And often it's as easy as just asking someone if they're they're okay. There's a ton of work we have to do. You can see from this um, that there are a lot of interventions that we don't know that much about. Um, we need more money for research. We need um, more people working on these interventions, both doing them and studying them. Um, there's a lot that we have to do. Um, but with that, there's a place for you in it. So if you're interested in helping reduce suicide, talk to me. I'm more than happy to help put you in a position or um, help you find a position where you can make a difference. Um, because there's a lot of work to do for us to bend the curve. But we have a start, but we need your help.